Le, comme vous savez, les matériaux quantiques, euh, il y a eu beaucoup de progrès dans les, pour ce qui est de prédire les propriétés des matériaux à l'aide de la méthode de densité fonctionnelle et euh, les méthodes de, de théorie de champ moyen euh, dynamique. Un des matériaux qui est le plus célèbre de ce temps-ci, en fait, à part l'équipat, évidemment, <rire> C'est le ruténate de strontium, où il y a beaucoup d'études assez détaillées de ce matériau-là qui ont été faites. On peut dire que l'état normal est pas mal compris. Il reste des détails à, à résoudre, mais en général, l'état normal est, est bien compris. Par contre, l'état supraconducteur euh, demeure un, 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 un mystère. Donc, euh, aujourd'hui, on a la chance d'avoir quelqu'un qui est un spécialiste des méthodes euh, justement pour faire des calculs réalistes, qui, est, qui sont quand même très exigeantes, c'est-à-dire qu'il faut connaître euh, les méthodes DFT en détail, les méthodes de théorie de champ moyen dynamique. Et puis euh, aujourd'hui, donc, on est dans une période où on essaie, de, avec les programmes finalement, de mêler, entre guillemets, ou d'utiliser les deux méthodes en même temps. Donc, euh, notre conférencier, euh, entre autres, euh, insérer les méthodes des MFT dans le logiciel qui est très connu, qui s'appelle le, le logiciel Trix. Et puis, il s'est attaqué dans sa thèse au problème de la supraconductivité, qui est en fait assez subtil, puis qui demeure encore assez mystérieux. Donc, il est allé, après sa thèse, peut-être probablement ce qui est maintenant le meilleur endroit au monde pour ce genre de calcul, qui est au Flatiron Institute à, à New York, où il est postdoc depuis, euh, depuis deux ans. Alors, plusieurs d'entre vous le connaissent, puisqu'il a passé du temps à Sherbrooke euh, dans ses jeunes années d'étudiant avant de devenir euh, un postdoc euh, célèbre. <rire> Alors, c'est plaisir de vous présenter euh, Olivier Ginga. Merci beaucoup, André-Marie, pour la belle introduction. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll switch to English so that most of you can understand. Uh, yeah, so I'm Olivier Gingras from the Flatiron Institute. So today I'm, I'm going to be, whoa, okay. Today I'm going to be talking about uh, some recent works that we've been on the superconducting state of strontium routinate. Um, it's really a pleasure for me to be back here, so I'm glad to see you guys. So for those who don't know strontium routinate very well, I'm going to do a pretty long introduction so that you know what André-Marie summarized in a few sentences. Um, but really, strontium routinate is kind of an high quality uh, undoped analog of uh, lanthanum copper oxide superconductor. So the point is that it can be superconducting without being doped. So that led to, you know, extremely good quality samples where you have Uh, very beautiful measurements, uh, uh, you know, so because the samples are so clean, basically in this material, uh, every probe was used either on the normal state or the superconducting state. And so now we have really the best measure measurements with no uh, corruptions from impurity. So this system is kind of considered as a model material where when you want to try a new technique, experimental technique or a numerical method, This is kind of a benchmark that you use, uh, at least in the normal state. So the normal state is very well understood. Uh, and there's a beautiful agreement between theory and the experiment. And in particular, it's well understood as a Unz metal, as we will see. But just like André-Marie said, the, superconduct the superconducting uh, state is still highly discussed. And in particular, something as fundamental as the symmetry of the superconducting order per meter. Um, <laughs> is still unresolved. And as we will see, uh, there are seeming, the reason why it's still discussed is that there are seemingly contradicting experimental evidence. Okay. Um, yes, so there's experiments that if you interpret in a specific way, will give different conclusions on the nature of the superconducting state. And uh, I mean, it's not surprising. This is a very challenging system with many orbitals that are involved. Their spin orbit coupling and the critical temperature at which we find it to be superconducting is very low. Um, but still, I mean, this material being a model in the normal state, uh, it should be, I mean, if we have a good theory of superconductivity, we should be able to also predict this super, superconducting state. So in some sense, uh, the fact that we still have problems with this description highlights some kind of lack of our understanding of 
basic superconductivity, unconventional superconductivity in this in this case. And so this is why this system is uh, still an open challenge, challenge uh, which continuously motivates the improvement of both experimental technique and theory techniques. So that's the plan of the talk. So I'm going to do a, an overview on strontium rutinate and then present um, three works where we use the num different numerical approaches to uh, study the superconducting state of this material. So first of all, let's briefly discuss the normal state. So as I said, this material uh, shares a lot of similarities with uh, lanthanum copper oxide. So basically they're isostructural. They have the same point group symmetry, but they also have very similar lattice parameters. Actually, strontium rutinate was used as a substrate for uh, lanthanum copper oxide before it was discovered to be superconducting. And just like the cuprate, uh, the main physics is believed to reside in the uh, transition metal oxide plane. Uh, so for the cuprate, it's copper oxide planes, and in uh, strontium rutinate, it's ruthenium oxide plane. But the major difference is that um, the cuprates are usually you know, discussed in the context of having only a single orbital that is active at the Fermi level. And this is why it's often simulated within the one band Hubbard model. But in strontium rutinate, there are three orbitals that are active at the Fermi level, namely the three T2G orbitals shown here, X, Y, Y, Z, and Z, X. And so we need to have a multi-orbital generalization of the Hubbard model to describe the interactions in this material. Typically, we use Kanamori interaction, which is essentially uh, the same thing as Hubbard, but for multiband. So you have a on-site Coulomb repulsion cost U, but uh, if you're on different orbitals and with the spin being aligned, it's less energetically costly to be in such a configuration due to Unz coupling, which favors same spin alignment. And so this is kind of the interaction that would describe this material. And if you do DFT uh, with this uh, to, to study this material, and then you include the lacking uh, local correlation through DFT plus DMFT, then as we will see, there's a beautiful agreement with experiment in particular here the Fermi surface, the old one and the new one. There's a beautiful agreement. Um, but before I go into some uh, experimental discussion, I just want to, you know, briefly mention that dynamic, what dynamical mean field theory is, because I'm going to be referring to it a lot in this talk. So the idea in dynamical mean field theory is that because the interaction is totally local, it only acts on a single site, then you can simply take your lattice, your whole lattice, and project it on a single correlated site. So now you, you map this whole lattice problem with an on-site uh, interaction onto an effective problem where you have a single site connected to a dynamical, uh, to a bat dynamically. And uh, there's a way to solve this, uh, this simpler problem here of an impurity in a, in a bat. And from this, you can extract all the local correlations within the self energy and once you obtain, once you have extract these correlations, the self energy from this effective system, you can embed them back in the lattice and then you iterate uh, on this procedure until convergence and you can describe the correlations on the lattice. So this is the idea of the MFT. The point is that we are dealing with a local interaction and we map on a single site here. So, okay, so DFT plus DMFT in the context of transform root NATE has been uh, very successful. So some, uh, you know, one of the key thing uh, that highlights this fact is the mass renormalization. So it's standard in in correlated system that uh, the mass of the electrons that you think you would obtain from DFT are underestimated because it's lacking electronic correlations. Um, and if you look at the renormalization compared to DFT from quantum oscillation, you see that the numbers are pretty large, so it's an intermediate to strongly cor correlated system. And the, the, the masses depend on the different Fermi surfaces of the material. And this is beautifully reproduced within the FT plus DMFT calculation, where, uh, where it was shown that the Unz coupling, which favors same spin alignment, was shown to lead to this you know, differentiation between the different orbital, the different bands, the different effective masses on the band and leads to the correct uh, order of uh, magnitude of the value of the mass. Another success from the MFT is the description of the bad metal to Fermi liquid crossover in strontium rutinate. 
So strontium rutnate is well known to have a very beautiful uh, Fermi liquid regime at pretty low temperature, 25 Kelvin. And above that, there's a lot of incoherent scattering. And this is kind of a hallmark of Unz metal, where you have a differentiation between the orbital degrees of freedom, the spin degrees of freedom, so that you know the, these degrees of freedom will freeze at different temperature. And the full coherence of the quasi-particle really happens at a lower temperature. Um, and all of these quantities, these temperature scales here, these energy scales are very beautifully captured by uh, this calculation here that Fabian did also at the Flatiron using uh, the numerical renormalization group. And this is kind of a, a signature of Unz metals, this different, these different scales. And the final thing I want to mention is the presence of strong spin fluctuations. <laughs> In this material, so if you were if you are to do uh, inelastic neutron scattering and look at the magnetic susceptibility, which shows you uh, the the momentum dependence of the spin fluctuations, you will find large peaks that shows that there's a, there are strong spin fluctuations. And if you want to calculate this using simply DFT, um, DFT will give you certain nesting vectors, which will give rise to these peaks, but they are not exactly reproducing the the experimental evidence. Instead, you need to incorporate vertex correction through the MFT to have a, a very, you know, to have a great agreement with experiment. So what we have learned on the normal state is that DFT plus DMFT is really able to uh, to explain it very well as a as a mat well for strontium rutinate it's explained as a material with strong local electronic correlations, which are crucial in order to understand it as a Unz metal. And it also leads to strong spin fluctuations in the material. But now the question is, if DFT plus DMFT is so good to describe the normal state, then what can it tell us about the superconducting state? And in particular, are these strong correlations and spin fluctuations that are shown to be present from DFT plus DMFT in the normal state? Well, are they the right mediator of superconductivity? And what can we gain from this method to understand the superconducting state here? And here, I just want to show that uh, it's expected that these spin fluctuations are indeed the mediator of superconductivity in this material based on simple uh, isotrop, uh, isoelectronic or non-isoelectronic doping. So what we see here is that by substituting some atoms of strontium rutinate, you quickly fall into one of these uh, magnetically ordered state here, spin glass or spin density wave. And basically, strontium rutinate lies in the vicinity of all, of all of these magnetic states. So basically, you can think of that as you have a lot of magnetic fluctuation here that leads to a magnetic order. And once these are suppressed sufficiently, then these spin fluctuations can, instead of leading to magnetic order, they will lead to uh, superconductivity and they act as a pairing glue, basically. OK, what about the superconducting state? What do we know about this? So before entering into a discussion of all the evidence from uh, experiments. I want to make sure that everyone is on the same page in terms of symmetry classifications. Um, so superconductivity is uh, is an order an ordered states, which is, you know, it's it's characterized by the breaking of a symmetry from the normal state. So you start from the normal state, you fall into the superconducting state, and there is a symmetry that will be broken. In this case, it's the number of particles because the order parameter is the expectation value of destroying two electrons. So you have a ground state, you destroy electrons, and you still fall into the ground state. That means that your number of particles is not uh, is not conserved. And depending on the quantum numbers of these electrons, in this case, there's just momentum and spin. Well, because these electrons are fermions, when you exchange all quantum numbers, it's the same as exchanging the particles. And this leads to a minus sign. Um, and so, and so this is a fundamental property of the gap function. If you exchange all the quantum numbers of the electrons, you have a minus sign and you can look at this gap function in terms of separating these quantum numbers. So if it's, if they are decoupled, you can look at just exchanging the spins and then the gap function can be either even or odd under the exchange of these spins and same thing for momentum, but exchanging all of them leads to a minus sign. So you're you're constrained to have either a spin singlet even parity state for this simple case, or a spin triplet odd parity state. Now, 
number conservation number of particle is uh, is broken in the superconducting state but additional symmetries can be broken in particular the symmetries of the normal state point group in this case it's d4h and actually this is this is a signature of unconventional superconductivity because basically in conventional superconductivity the mediator is leads to attraction between the pairs so it's very very easy for the the system to to respect the normal point group symmetries but in unconventional superconductivity it's said to be repulsive interactions which force the gap to have kind of these uh, complicated um you know momentum dependence which leads to breaking of uh, symmetries so the the way to discuss the breaking of symmetries is in terms of irreducible representations um, and you can use, I mean, this is just the language of uh, group theory, but you, you, usually you, you, instead of saying which symmetries are broken, you will talk about what label is associated to, you know, these symmetry breakings. We will use that in the talk. But in the jargon of the, the field, basically people don't use these irreducible representations too much. Instead, they talk about the projection of these irreducible representations on the real spherical harmonics, which can be sometimes confusing. Um, but here are some examples. So for a, a spherical uh, Fermi surface, so if you have a conventional superconductor here where the gap is just constant everywhere, this project on S wave, so we say it's an S wave, and because this is even parity in this case, typically uh, it forces it to be spin singlet. Here we have an example of a two-dimensional irreducible representation, EU, which projects on uh, PX and PY in a degenerate manner. Because this is odd uh, parity, then we will have a spin triplet state. And here we have the, you know, the well-known uh, state of the the cuprates, what is thought to be the, the the symmetry of the cuprates. So this B1G state projects on dx square minus y square, and is a singlet. If you have any questions, yeah, um, yeah. So here I'm just considering a static static order parameter in this case. I will be back with frequency dependent a little bit later in the talk. You're foreshadowing a lot here. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, in this case, I just consider my electrons to have two, uh, two quantum numbers. So I cannot have even frequency in this case. It's the same. But indeed, we will see that when there's additional degrees of freedom, the, the gap function can be odd on more quantum numbers than just singlet and parity. Yeah. No. no. Forgot to put the animation here, but here are some of the uh, established fact about Strunsum root nate. First of all, it's all the all the the experimental measurements I'm going to show basically points it to be uh, unconventional. Um, and okay, so all of them will kind of show this, but the first the first experiment that highlighted this fact was the fact that when you add uh, non-magnetic impurities, it quickly destroys the superconducting state. So this is an indication that your gap function, uh, I mean, when you add non-magnetic impurities, what happens is that you will average all the states on your gap on your Fermi fur surface. And, um, and so if you have a sign changing gap with nodes in particular, then this, this averaging will lead to zero very quickly. So that's why having such a behavior in terms of non-magnetic impurities is considered to be a signature of uh, unconventional, unconventionality. Another important aspect of transfer root nate is uh, the spin singlet dominated composition of the Cooper pairs. So this has been a very long discussion for transfer root nate. Actually, the same, very same experiments for 25 years were pointing toward the opposite conclusion, which is that it was spin triplet. And the reason is that here, what we're looking at is the, the magnetic susceptibility uh, in the presence of a small field. So because you have a small field here, uh, when you when you go into the superconducting state, if the pairs are singlet, they cannot they cannot align with the field and they will reduce the spin susceptibility. While in the triplet, they can maybe align. So in a triplet state, you would expect it to be uh, you know to be constant if you're in the right direction, and in a singlet state, you would expect it to be uh, decreasing. And for a long time, basically, they were eating up the sample by doing this measurement. So they thought it was the signature of triplet, but by carefully redoing this experiment just a few years ago, they highlighted the to totally opposite uh, behavior. Um, 
Another important aspect here is the presence of node on the Fermi surface. So that's been uh, that that has been shown by uh, thermal measurement, uh, by uh, transport measurement, particularly in the group of Louis here. And uh, what it shows is that even at uh, zero temperature, there is still a residual um, scattering of the of the the Cooper pairs. So this is an indication that you have a very small gap, uh, or in particular a node, because it remains at you know zero temperature. There's always you know the the, the size of temperature which can be a problem, but they went low enough in, in order to be able to uh, state that it was nodes on the Fermi surface. And in particular, the, 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 the behavior of these nodes is extremely similar to what you would expect from a textbook D wave. And finally, here, uh, what is well known is that when you apply uniaxial strain on the material, you will see the critical temperature shoot up by a factor of more than two. And this is explained by the fact that uh, when you apply pressure, the Fermi surface expands toward the zone boundary where there's a Van Hoff singularity, which means that there's a lot of states to be available uh, for pairing. So uh, this this interpretation of the of the result that it comes from the Van Hoff singularity actually is in well, because this Van Hoff singularity is at the time reversal invariant point, it's at k equal minus, minus k. This is inconsistent with odd parity pairing, and so this measurement is usually understood as a proof of the even parity nature of the superconducting state. I have the same problem here. Yeah. OK, so now the conflicting measurements. Um, so first of all, there's one category here, which uh, points towards the fact that the state would have two components in the gap function. Maybe I do this. OK. <laughs> That's my animation, yeah. <laughs> OK, um, so the two component nature can be well, can be inferred by the fact that the state is believed to break time reversal symmetry uh, to break time reversal symmetry. So the way this happens is when there's small magnetic field that are generated with, uh, within the samples. And one uh, one way to understand this is that you can have chiral state that are generating these small magnetic fields and to have chiral state in the superconductors, usually you need to have two components in the gap function, which are related by a complex phase. For example, here, if you have two degenerately related uh, components like PX and PY with a complex phase, you have a symmetry protected PX plus IPY, chiral PY. Or here, another example is when two irreducible representation are accidentally degenerate, and then they can also lead to these chiral states. So this two component na nature is also highlighted by ultrasounds here. So when you do ultrasounds, what you do is that you you kind of pr uh, you you pump a type of excitation which is exactly in a certain irreducible representation. In this case, a B2G irreducible representation, and you will see that the gap, uh, the superconducting state, will couple to this shear mode only if it uh, satisfies uh, satisfy certain constraints on the possible two component order. And the fact that it couples to B2G is a clear signature that it's two component. And in particular, it has to be, it constrains these two irreducible representation. Here I show some of the leading candidates that were proposed for strontium rutinate. Um, yes. The final, the final experiment here that uh, highlights two component is that, you know, if you have two degenerate components, if you apply a perturbation like uniaxial strain, you would expect to lift this degeneracy. And in particular, you would expect to have a first temperature transition towards the in the superconducting state, and then a second one in the time reversal symmetry breaking state. And this is exactly what is uh, observed in mu SR. But okay, so this is kind of an interesting and uh, coherent picture that there's two components. What's the problem? The problem is that when you look at all the thermodynamic uh, quantities, any thermodynamic measurements actually is much better explained by having a single component. And this is really strange because uh, in general, thermodynamic measurements and in particular ear specific heat or what I show here is the elastocaloric effect. These measurements are extremely sensitive to the change in the order per meter. And historically, they have been highlighting, you know, hidden order orders where any other method don't see anything and they see that there's a, a second transition. But here there's absolutely no second transition where you would expect it from the mu SR. 
And so this is very, very strange. Uh, you know, people tend to believe much more thermodynamic measures because they're really, you know, they're direct measurements of what's going on. While this mu SR is extracted in a in a bit of an indirect way, and yeah, so there's a lot of discussions about wh what's going on because time reversal symmetry was also believed for, you know, 20 years to be present in this material. So this is what we know in the superconducting state so far. It's mainly singlet bay. Uh, well, it's mainly made of singlets. Uh, it seems to have two components that couple with B2G and break time reversal symmetry. And it appears to be even parity due to the rise of TC under new axial strain. But there's this tension between the two transition temperature in USR and the one temperature transition in specific heat. So there's a lot of theory works that were done to propose candidates. In particular, here you have this D wave state uh, that you know that fit that that works with all the thermodynamic measurements. But there's always this tension of trying to explain these two experiments at the same time. And there's basically in the standard way of thinking about the problem, it's very inconsistent. These two things are very inconsistent. So in this talk, I'm going to be presenting numerical methods where we try to to see what is revealed, you know, from kind of a first principle approach. What is the what are the leading uh, symmetries for this system? And we naturally, first of all, we naturally find that this D wave is indeed dominant in this system, but also uh, our results point towards another solution, which is a little bit outside of this framework of thinking, as you will see. So here are the numerical approaches. So the question is, how do you study superconductivity um, numerically or, you know, so uh, what kind of numerical simulation will give you this information? So what we would like to do is perform a computation here, for example, in the superconducting state um, at zero strain. And then we could extract the whole Gorkov function, which tells us about the, the pairing of the electrons. We can look at what irreducible representation dissatisfies, and then we would have our answer. We could do the same calculation uh, at these two stars here that are trouble pointing. Um, so, you know, you, you could look here, what is the irreducible representation? What is it here? And then, you know, that would be that would be very nice, but it's really too hard to do numerically. Uh, as I pointed before, because it's multi-orbital system, in the NEMBU basis, we need to expand the basis, and most importantly, the critical temperature is so low that we never reach that. So instead, what we do is that we look here, for example, uh, at high temperature from the normal state, and actually much higher than this. So indeed, in, in this region, the Gorkov function is just zero, so we cannot simply compute that, but we can in, instead compute the pairing susceptibility, which is how much this Gorkov function change, changes when you add a small pairing field. So this is non-zero even in the normal state. And actually what happens is that when you lower the temperature, uh, this thing this thing will increase and increase and it will diverge at the critical temperature. So what this means is that an infinitesimally small field triggers a superconducting transition. Or in other words, there's a spontaneous symmetry breaking transition to the superconducting state. But in the normal, right? So the strategy here is to, uh, you know, look at the normal state, compute the sparing susceptibility, and then we don't reach the the point where it actually diverges. But we can look at the eigenvalues of this quantity, and the associated eigenvectors. Uh, so we can look at what eigenvalue would diverge, you know, at lower temperature, and we can inspect the symmetry of the eigenvector to give us information on possible candidates. That's kind of the strategy. So first work is based on the Ilyasberg equation. It's a work I've been doing in my PhD with André Marie, uh, Reza, Nikita, and uh, with Michel Cote from University of Montreal. And again, the idea here is to compute this pairing susceptibility, which can be expressed as a sum of diagrams. It's a sum of diagram. Basically, what it what it describes is Okay, I have two electrons that can propagate freely, two quasiparticles, and then I add all the diagrams of how they can possibly interact together through this uh, pairing vertex here, which describes all the irreducible two-particle interactions. Um, so you can sum all of these orders of diagrams, so zeroth order, first order, third order, second, third, infinite, and it gives you this uh, equation here. 
And what you can see is that, uh, you know, the propagation of just two electrons will not lead to pairing. It's really the interactions here. So when you consider a glue, then you can have pairing. And so we can look at when this, uh, this susceptibility diverges is the same thing as looking at when this operator here has an eigenvalue of minus one. So basically, this is the Eliasberg equation. We construct this operator. We solve the eigenvalue problem. And uh, we look at the eigenvalue, the largest eigenvalue, and the corresponding eigenvector can be uh, studied to, you know, you can analyze what symmetries it transforms like, and this gives us candidate for the possible superconducting symmetries. Now the problem here is actually constructing this operator. So how do we do that? Basically, we go in a in a similar formalism where we look at particle all susceptibility, which has a very similar, you know, way of being a, a expanded in terms of diagrams. Um, and the idea is that the vertex in the particle all channel is the same as, well, it, it describes the same processes as in the particle particle channel. So you can express the pairing in the particle particle channel in terms of exchange of uh, spin fluctuations and charge fluctuations in the particle all channel. So what this allows us to do is we can phenomenologically construct or you know have a theory for this particle all vertex. And through this spark equations here, we will be able to construct the pairing glue for superconductivity. So uh, yeah, so that's good what we're going to do. We assume local static interaction, the particle all channel, and this will give us all the, the momentum and frequency dependence and the retardation of the pairing in the part pairing channel. Now, how do we construct this particle all vertex? In this case, in the work I'm going to be presenting, we simply I mean, we simply take the Kanamori interaction that I described before. So this is the bare local uh, static interaction. Uh, this is the approximation that we do here. And so this is kind of the framework of this Ilyasberg framework. First of all, we do a normal state calculation with DFT plus DMFT or just DFT or any anything that you like that gives you a good one particle propagator that is expressed in a specific basis uh, here in spin orbital, so these T2G orbitals. With this, we can easily construct these bare susceptibilities, which, which are just the propagation of two electrons or two holes. And now we assume a specific uh, particle hole vertex, which will allow us to construct the whole spin and charge fluctuation spectrums, which are used as a pairing glue in superconductivity. And then once we have this operator, the pairing glue, we can solve the Eliasberg equation and look at the leading eigenvalues and eigenvectors. OK, so before showing some results, I need to discuss about the symmetry classification here because we have a few more quantum numbers, as Jan was foreshadowing here. So now our electrons not only have momentum and spin, but they also live in a spin orbital uh, space here, the T2G orbitals. And because of the retardation of the of the pairing uh, the pairing glue, they also depend on frequency. But again, if we exchange all of these quantum numbers, this gap function should be odd under under such an operation. And if these quantum numbers are decoupled, then it will be odd or even under the exchange of each of these quantum numbers uh, separately. So spin, momentum, orbitals, and time or frequency here. So this is the case, it, they are decoupled without spin orbit coupling. Um, and so we can talk about pure spot representation. So even odd, 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 for example, or something like that. But when we consider spin orbit coupling, then some of these degrees of freedom, most of them actually become coupled together and uh, the description becomes much more complicated. This is one of the things that was highlighted in our work. So let's see some results. So now I'm gonna show what is the leading eigenvalue the symmetry of the leading eigenvector, uh, depending on here a phase diagram. So it depends on the interaction that we use to model the, the, the on-site particle all vertex. So basically we choose an interaction, we do the whole framework and we find a, one leading eigenvector. We look at its symmetry and here it is. So in blue region here, um, this state is mostly, well, is, is purely spin singlet and it's essentially a D wave on the XY orbital. So the way to read this uh, gap function here that I showed, first there's a real and imaginary part. And Cooper pairs here can, well, they have two electrons, which can have you know, three different orbitals, x, y, y, z, and z, x. 
so here this three by three matrix is which orbitals are used to construct the, the Cooper pairs. And in each of these squares, it's the momentum structure of this uh, component of the order parameter. So here you see that this blue region is really a D wave here where you have dx square minus y square purely on the x, y orbitals. Now, the orange dome here is purely odd on the exchange of the orbital. So now you have Cooper pairs that are form of two different orbitals. One electron is one on one orbital and the other one of the Cooper pairs on another one. And the minus sign in the gap function comes from exchanging these orbital labels. And third here, we have an odd frequency. So this one is purely odd in frequency. We'll be back to this one. But first, I want to see what happens to this orange dome when I include spin orbit coupling. So this is what happened. Basically, it disappears. But actually, it doesn't really disappear. What happens is that it mixes with the other, uh, the other states to form a, just a more complicated state in this case. So we call it B1G because this is kind of a spin orbit uh, generalized D wave, but it transforms exactly like B1G, like the irreducible representation. It's just that now it's much more complex and all the uh, spin orbital uh, components are coupled together because of spin orbit coupling. But you can see that you have this main component that is D wave here. This is also D wave for some non obvious reasons. And the odd orbital part is also present and also contributes to the B1G. So this is really just a D wave generalized for spin orbit coupling. And this other state here, the A2G uh, minus in red, is a spin orbit coupling generalized odd frequency state. So what you can see is that, uh, so th these are the main odd frequency component, which contribute to a, a large portion of this, uh, this uh, superconducting, superconducting state. And there are important also odd uh, orbital components. Um, and so in this paper, we argued that uh, this state, because it's odd frequency, odd frequency is vanishing at, at the Fermi level. So it doesn't really open new, uh, uh, new gaps on the Fermi level. It doesn't change really at the Fermi, Fermi level. And this other part here that is odd in orbital mainly, uh, mainly couples different orbitals, which happens a lot at different energies than the Fermi level. So we argued that this A to G state here being odd frequency would not contribute a lot to the specific heat. And so that leads to a, so this calculation leads to a pretty, um, you know, it, 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 it suggests that we could have actually a state at the boundary between these two, which would be an accidental degeneracy between this spin orbit generalized D wave and spin orbit generalized uh, odd frequency state. And so we propose this solution as the D wave plus odd frequency solution, in some sense. And so this solution, when compared with the experimental fact presented before, so it's uh, dominated by spin singlets. Uh, it would be th this accidental degeneracy would be two components that would couple to the B2G shear mode. It would break time reversal symmetry and be even parity. And this kind of end wave argument about the specific E would lead to an agreement between these uh, this tension here because by breaking the symmetry with uniaxial uh, strain, what you could expect that you first fall into this D wave, which leads to a big signature in specific heat. And then at the lower temperature, you begin to break time reversal symmetry without having a large uh, effect on specific heat. So, yes. So this work really highlights uh, the dominance, I would say, of the D wave in Strunstrom Rootnate. And it proposes a nice alternative for a second component. So then we were interested in, you know, in studying this problem with other methods. So in particular, this is the work of uh, Jonas Alt from Germany, which came to the to the flat iron to do a, a pre-doc in one of our pre-doc program, which you are all invited to apply if you you are eligible. This is our very nice program where you can be in the, the flat iron for four months. And uh, is pre-doc led to this uh, publication? Uh, where we use functional renormalization group. But OK, so he's really the expert of uh, FRG. So I'm going to try to give a brief description of what is going on in FRG. So the way I understand it is that you start with a description of you know, very high energy. Uh, you, know, you, you have a, a large scale of what can happen in your system. And you, you slowly reduce the energy scale and integrate out the extra degrees of freedom in order to uh, simplify in some sense, your theory and to make it available at 
smaller energy scale, but also the fact that you integrate out these higher, or these higher energy states lead to a renormalization of the, the remaining state. And so by integrating out some of these, these nodes here, you get an effective theory which has renormalized couplings. And you do that iteratively until you reach you know, a very small energy scales. And in the functional uh, variant of RG, this is done through uh, a functional uh, functional way. So there's a there, there's really a mathematical way to connect different energy scales, uh, which is actually reversible in this case. So what we do is we start with a three orbital description of transform root nate with all of this this uh, bandwidth here. Um, we add the Kanamori Hamiltonian that simulates you know the U and J uh, interaction terms, and we let the code of Jonas basically go to lower and lower energy scale, look at the new renormalized couplings. And in particular, it, it looks at uh, the susceptibility, pairing susceptibility or particle all. And at some point, one of these will diverge. And then you say, OK, I reached my critical scale, which is analogous to a critical temperature. And you can look at what is the thing that actually diverged and uh, analyze it. And this is what we get. So in some, uh, so another thing about this code is that it doesn't take into account uh, frequency dependence of the self energy, so he only has access to static order parameters. And what he found, what he found is that um, there's a lot of spin density waves which are expected in this system, but the only superconducting state that seems to be dominant here is a D wave, uh, D wave state that is exactly the one that you know matches with thermodynamic measurements and also that is obtained within the Eliasberg formalism. So note here that there's only the D wave and we don't have access to frequency dependence, so we cannot see any odd frequency state here. And so this work really, again, put emphasis on the fact that the D wave is really dominant in this system. Um, yes. And so finally, I want to end up with this work, which is still uh, being built, but uh, it's going to be soon ready. And it's based on dynamical external pairing fields. So one um, one thing that we've noticed by uh, when in the in the Elasberg solutions is that the odd frequency state is really not too much k dependent. So there's not a lot of k dependence. So basically, it means that this this state is basically local. And since it's highly frequency dependent and local, it's a perfect kind of state that can be studied within dynamical mean field theory on a single impurity uh, directly. So this is kind of the idea. We want to do DMFT, and this is the previous framework. In this case, we want to avoid all of this construction of the two-body interaction, extracting the pairing glue, doing the Eliasberg equation. This is prone to a lot of this is prone to a lot of approximation and a lot of uh, you know error. So we, in some sense, we wanted to get rid of that to verify our result by simply going directly to the superconducting state. But again, this is very hard. This is a three orbitals in Nambu, which means six orbitals to very low temperature. So we need some kind of trick to be able to study the superconducting state. So instead of all this Eliasberg business, what we do is add source fields. So the idea here is, okay, we work directly in Nambu basis where we treat electrons and hole on the same footing. This allows us to access the Gorkov function. And now we're gonna study the same system, but where we add an external source term which uh, which directly couples to uh, to pairing in some sense and so um, the idea in some sense of this work is that we do a full dmft calculation and then we add explicitly source terms to kind of numerically probe uh, our, sol our numerical solution and because we're interested in uh, odd frequency these fields need to be highly frequency dependent because this is a you know this is a formalism that is used a lot where you add static field, you just add a static part, you can add it to your Hamiltonian, and then you take the limit where the field is zero. But here we want frequency dependent field, so we had to to generalize this method. But once you have this field, this gives you a specific Gorkov function which is field dependent, and then you can look at the limit where this field is zero, and that allows uh, allows us to reconstruct this whole pairing susceptibility again in the normal state. And we can look at how the eigenvalues uh, evolve and see, uh, you know, and predict kind of a phase transition and uh, the associated symmetry. So there's a, a bit of a formalism here. 
you know, if we want to have really the full frequency dependence, we need to select a full basis in frequency space. This is done through Legendre polynomials. But in some sense, what, what I want you to get from this is just the fact that at the end, we extract the susceptibility in, in this basis of Legendre polynomials. And the main, you know, the main framework here is that we do one DMFT calculation that is converged without any field. This is our normal state. And then we explicitly add each of these Legendre polynomials as, a new, as an external field, which gives us a specific response of the system. We can extract the coefficients of, the, of all of these response to construct the full matrix of the pairing susceptibility in the Legendre basis. And then we can extract the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this thing. And in particular, what's very nice from this is we get the full frequency dependence of the eigenvectors. Uh, yes. So here are some results. Won't go too much into it. I will just show that this is one over the eigenvalue. So the lower it is, the larger is the eigenvalue. And we can try to kind of predict at what temperature it, it, it crosses zero. Here it happens at very low temperature in this odd frequency channel. And this low, I mean, these states here that are dominating in this temperature regime is exactly the state that we found in Iliasberg. So this odd frequency intraorbital state. And the interesting thing from this work, so this is nice. I mean, it confirms that, you know, we're not, we're not doing too bad with the Iliasberg because it actually predicts the same thing as when you go into strong coupling DMFT. Um, but, but we also find this state here that is, you know, the eigenvalue is much large, is much smaller than the odd frequency one, but the intersection with uh, with zero is at much higher temperature. And we believe from, uh, you know, from, uh, well, we presume here that this is kind of a, this is an effect of the D wave trying to be realized in this uh, in this single impurity, but in order to be realized, it needs to acquire this very, very strong uh, retardation effect. So basically this state is almost zero at zero time and it's it's highly retarded. So we need to do, you know, we need to expand this method to more sites, to clusters actually, if we want to, uh, to resolve this issue. But uh, yeah, that's very, very challenging. But kind of the, the, the main thing about this work, I would say, is that the leading state is really uh, this odd frequency state. And there seems to be some D wave like uh, candidate also that is trying to be uh, relevant here. So, OK, let me just conclude. So, strontium rutinate is very well understood in a normal state as a Hund's metal, but the superconducting state is highly debated. And it's an important problem if we want to be able to. You know, if we want to be able to say that we understand unconventional superconductivity, I think this system should be solved. At least, uh, at least there should be agreement within the experiments, and then having a predictive theory would lead to, you know, a good benchmark of what we can do in terms of predicting superconducting states. Um, so far, the leading candidate is this D wave that is uh, that is, you know, put forward by uh, thermodynamic measurements, but there's still tension with the, this time reversal symmetry breaking stuff. So I presented different numerical methods. One of them is was biased uh, on the Eliasberg framework, and uh, our result is that um, is that there's again this D wave is is highly dominant in this framework, um, and our framework also highlights the the fact that odd frequency is an interesting candidate that could help kind of resolve these tensions. But really, I want to I want to stress that there's a lot of improvement that are possible to be made on the Eliasberg framework because this pairing glue, this description of the pairing glue is, involves a lot of approximation. And this is something we work a lot on at the Flatiron. I, I showed another method based on FRG where this D wave pairing is again highly dominant. Um, and I showed a new method where we can expect the full uh, frequency dependent susceptibility. And this one seems to suggest that this odd frequency state is also a state that seems to be important. Um, in this system. So on that, I would like to uh, thank you for your attention and I'm ready for some questions. Thank you for this very impressive uh, work and, uh, and talk, yes.